Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Katherine Taylor. Well, this is a show all about the writing process from creation to publication. And here is where you can find inspiration, ideas, and meet the people behind the stories and the books that you love to read. I like to say that we bring life to books. And remember, if you are watching live, you can make a comment. We'll do our best to answer. I won't guarantee it, but we will do our best. And also, if you've missed some of our shows, they are all available 24-7 on my YouTube channel at Katherine Taylor TV. And of course, they're available here on this channel as well. Now, my guest today, let's get down to the good part. My guest today lives in Tors Cove, Newfoundland in Labrador, where she owns and operates a very unique micro press called Running the Goat Books and Broadsides. I just love that name, a very unique name you say. <laughs> yes, it is. And we're going to find out all about that and more. And in her own words, she says that almost every stage of her life, her work has grown out of a love of and a delight in books and language. Well, we certainly share that in common. And I'd like to welcome her to the show, Marnie Parsons. And it takes a second for her to appear, but there she is. Hi, Marnie. How are you today? Good. How is it out in Tours Cove today? It's nice i mean overcast and cool but it's not raining which is a big plus so <laughs> same here in central newfoundland and we've had enough rain to float an arc lately so any day without rain is quite welcome a good day <laughs> it's a good day marnie it's so nice to have you on here and i know when i first heard heard about you actually one of my guests mentioned you and what you were doing and I was like oh I just have to have you on here anyone who runs a print shop called running the goat <laughs> books has to have an interesting story so tell me a little bit about your print shop and how you got involved in this business so the print shop is uh in in Tours Cove I have four vintage printing presses all of them are operational the youngest um is from the 1960s so it's really quite young and the oldest is from the 1830s. And that's a picture that you've got up there. That's oh, is it? Hand press. I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, hand press. So everything with that is done by hand. Um, all the type for all of the presses is set by hand using visible lead type. Um, with this one, you set up the press, you ink by hand, each paper goes in by hand, you crank it under the weight and lower the weights. Very, very involved process. It's really, really fun. And it's as close to the original sort of Gutenberg kind of printing that we have, um, in, at least in my shop. And that uh, it really is the most satisfying press to work with in a lot of ways. It's, and it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of machinery. It's all cast iron, beautiful cloth. Wow. As they say, they don't make them like that anymore. I, I think I have a few other pictures. I kept changing them yeah, a little press, fast. Actually. This is another press that um, is from the 1880s. So it's a little bit younger, but again, it's, um, and it's a slight advance on this one because it has what's called an inking disc, an ink disc mechanism. So it's got a little treadle. You put some ink on that round disc and you don't have to ink every sheet by hand. You can use your treadle. And it's got that beautiful flywheel, which is one of the main reasons I, I got uh, it. I got to say, it kind of looks like a sewing machine. <laughs> it does. It does. And it's got a treadle just like a sewing machine. So it has that, that sort of that principle. And it's, they're just such beautiful pieces of equipment. They're really lovely to be around. They're like art. Let me see what else did you have in this file? This is a, a shot of your storefront. Yeah, that's well, that's sort of the inside of the shop. When you come in, there's the counter and there's lots of bookcases and books and handmade books. And um, there's just a sort of a sense. And we carry prints as well from local printmakers, as well as all of our books, lots of other local books and lots of books from just, I love beautiful kids books. So I bring beautiful kids books from across the country and sometimes from outside of the country. Wow. And so if people are on the go in their own province this summer, this would be a beautiful place to, to stop in and, and have a look at everything you have there. Let's see what else. She had another photo while we're at it. Okay, what is this? This is, this is type that's been set and tied up. So each of those little pieces is an individual letter. So every single letter is set by hand. And then you tie up, in th it's what's called a page block. So you figure out, you set all the type to be on that page tied up and that's waiting to be put into the press bed so it could be printed. 
So wow. if you can get any sense from that, I realize looking at it, you might not <laughs> might not come across as clearly <laughs> when you don't know what it is, but it's it that would be hundreds and hundreds of little pieces of metal type that have been lined up together. Marnie, that would be hundreds and hundreds of hours to put those pieces <laughs> in as opposed to today. <laughs> yes, it takes quite a while, but it's actually really fun and meditative. What's what I find less fun is putting it all away because once you've printed, then you can put the type back and okay. uh, and reuse it. But I'm not as good at cleaning up as I. <laughs> well, it looks like some kind of a, um, um, I don't know, a futuristic game of Scrabble or something here. <laughs> and this one here, I think there is one more. Yeah, and this is just wood type, which everybody loves because it's so beautiful. It comes in lots of different sizes and shapes and different fonts. Um, and that one is just so visually fun, the, the wood type. That was a big poster. I had a, a student who was doing a work term with me a few years ago. We shared his term between me and another printer. And uh, so that was one of the things he did was he set up the press with that wood type to sort of play around and see what he could do with, in terms of design. And the wood type is, is so beautiful. Some of it, I grew up in Ontario and a lot of the wood type I have is from the newspaper in my hometown, which I sort of inherited from a friend of my father's who had been looking at it. So, it's got a real personal connection for me. So. Wow. And you know, when I when I look at this, it tells me that you do have a passion. You have a passion for the, the history of print and to see, you know, and just the restoration of, of these products. And I know you've actually used them at one point. You've printed books with these, have you not? Yeah, that's how I began printing books and what I call poem flits were just simple little um, publications with a poem and an image. Um, and broadsheets or broadsides, which are almost like posters. So that's how I began, was just doing little small runs of simple publications, you know, books that, a chapbook that might be eight pages long or 12 pages long. And then eventually it kind of grew. So the most recent book that I've done by hand is a 74 page book about um, boiled dinner. It's called Three Servings and everyone comes in a pudding bag. And one of the things that's really fun about doing the handmade books is you can play around with some of the conventions. So the boiled dinner book was actually designed so it would fit in a pudding bag. So that kind of limited the size of the pages, things like that. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah. And then then the book, I'm, I've got a big project on this summer, um, which is um, a poem sequence by a Mi'kmaq poet from Nova Scotia. And she's had the poem translated into 12 other languages. And so we'll be printing that. Um, that's a whole other adventure for me because of course I don't have type that would be that would have mm -hmm. was in Chinese or Japanese or Russian so we're we're taking a slightly different approach with that but it will all still be handmade and like press printed and that will be a really interesting um, project I'm looking fun to looking forward to sitting down and getting the presses with it so well, absolutely. And, and you use the word project because to me, when you talk about this and I think of the amount of work that must go into something like this, it's more than just a book. It's just maybe almost like a, I don't, I'm going to say a work of art or, an, you know, how they do installments, sometimes artists, but this is like very, a very tangible book, but, but work of art. I, I think so. I mean, I always tell people that I'm not an artist, I'm a craft person and I'm mm -hmm trouble from craftspeople because craft can be high art but I'm not I'm uh you know I, I I know printers who just do exquisite books and they will take 10 years to do a book you know and it will be absolutely wonderful and it will sell for thousands of dollars and I'm not that kind of letterpress printer but it does take a long time there's a lot of work with my presses every print every page goes through the printing press by hand you fold all the papers by hand you sew them the books by hand so it's very much an involved uh, thing. And the books that are result are um, higher priced than something that's commercially printed. They tend to be a little bit more delicate. You want to be careful with them and make sure that, uh, you know, that you don't damage them. And I also tend to use really nice papers because for me, a lot of it is all about the paper. So I get paper that's made in Czechoslovakia sometimes or Montreal. And um, yeah, so there's some really, there's, it's, it's, it's a very specific kind of uh, publication, the handmade books. Mm, sounds intriguing, though. I've got to come out and see some of these because when you like reading or you like holding books and being around books, <laughs> when you can have a, a product like that or when you talk about paper, that means something to me because I do feel paper and look at paper. And even, you know, when you read a book, you're aware of 
the texture of the paper and the, mm -hmm. the color of it and, and how the words sit on it. So I find it uh, very interesting to, to hear about this process. I can only imagine how much time it would take. Like it would take how long to make a book like this? It varies widely. It depends on how many pages, how many words on each page, if they're illustrations, if the illustrations are color or black and white. So, you know, I, I, the fastest I've probably ever done a, a book was maybe four weeks and that was working flat out. And it was a 12 page book. And, mm. uh, and it was because I had a deadline that I didn't want to miss, but it was, it was exhausting. <laughs> so, so I was hours and hours and hours. And it wasn't like there, was a, there weren't a lot of words on the pages. It did have, um, that one did have a bit of hand, uh, hand tinting. So there were line of cut illustrations and then I had to paint some of them and a bit of rubber stamping. Um, but that was like, I don't ever want to try and do that again. The one, <laughs> the one that I'm going to be working on this summer, I expect it'll be months. And uh, again, if depending on the print run, you might, you print all of one sheet and then you print all of the next page. Oh, okay. But, but then the sewing can also, also takes quite a little while. So you might have everything printed in five or six weeks, but then the sewing and the binding can take many, many weeks after that too. So mm -hmm. it's and I, a big answer, but the complexity of each publication is yeah. that certainly makes sense. And I'm trying to put my head around when you say sewing the books just together, but I remember years ago getting a book where some of the pages seemed to come out and there was almost a stitching um, process. But do you use machines for that as well or is that done by hand? No, uh it's done pretty much by hand. What I do have uh, is something called a signature punch which is, um, it's a very simple little thing that has um, little spikes lined up where you, you can adjust them where you want. And then you can put each page or each gathering of pages on that to punch the holes in the, in the crease so that when you go to sew, you've got your holes ready made for you. But it's, it's still um, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, it's still a, it's still a process. And, and so when we, um, um, I know that you um, are, sorry, I just got a little interruption here, which took my train of thought, I apologize. But when, when, you're, doing, um, when you're doing these books, but you also, not only this, but you also specialize in children's books and, and you describe them as a, a very curated selection of fine illustrated children's books. Let's just jump on to that for a minute because there aren't too many publishers who totally specialize in children's books. Well, certainly not in Newfoundland, anyhow. Um, yeah, the children's books grew out of the letterpress. Actually, I was, I did, um, I did a, a handmade book by Andy Jones and Philip Din called uh, Peg Bearskin, and it was about a big, ugly, hairy woman. So we made a big, ugly, hairy book, and it had a fun fur cover, and it was all letterpress printed, and we had these beautiful line cut illustrations, and it was a fabulous book. But a book like that, as you know, it's not going to be great for kids because the paper is really delicate mm -hmm. and also it's really expensive. So we decided to do a commercial facsimile. So I had somebody else actually, but who has modern equipment print a cop copies of it, but it would look very much like the original. And that was really fun to do. And it sold so well that um, Andy Jones came back to me with it, with another project and another project. And they just weren't ones that were, suited to the kinds of equipment that I have. So we started doing commercial children's books um, and, uh, and, and those have been wonderful. So I, what I really like in, a, in the books that we do for kids, although they're not handmade, I think they do have some of the, that quality and that aesthetic. So we do go for very nice paper when possible. We look for really great illustrations. And, um, and I love to work with illustrators who come from different cultural backgrounds because I feel like even if the story that we're publishing is a really local story, like um, with Andy, we did a series of five Jack tales that are all different mm -hmm. stories. Um, but the illustrator is from Slovenia and she has a totally different take on things and it really adds another layer of understanding to the stories, I think. So, so how interesting. I've got some of your, I've got some images here that I'm going to show. Sure. Um, here we go. Okay. And uh, these are, uh, yeah, why don't you tell us a bit? Sure. This is The Puffin Problem by Lori Duty, and it's illustrated by Lori. And these are the simplest books that, that we do for kids. They're for ages, you know, three to five or so. And Lori's are really fun because they're very, very local. 
they're all set in St. John's. You're never necessarily told it's St. John's, but it's recognizably St. John's to anybody who's there. Bright colors, real sort of folk art feel. Lori's a printmaker by training, and so you can really get a feeling for that in a lot of her work, but um, very playful. So what she does in a lot of her books is there'll be a store that's a surface that's recognizably from St. John's, but she'll change the name and play on, play on the name. Um, even though the stories are set in St. John's though, it, you don't have to, you don't, it's not crucial that you understand that it's St. John's, like it's totally fine. You'll have lots of fun and enjoy the story without, um, without those reference, but it means a little bit more um, for kids from St. John's. Her most recent book is called um, Mr. Beagle Goes to Rabbit Town. And it's about a beagle who moves to the part of St. John's that we know is Rabbit Town. But in this oh. rabbit, everybody's a rabbit. So <laughs> okay. when a beagle shows up in a, in a community that's owned rabbits. Um, so well, she, having been the owner of beagles, that's an interesting <laughs> combination. <laughs> he turns out to be a very helpful neighbor. But oh. she, does, she does lots of playful things. And those are the, those are probably the most traditional kids books that we do actually are Lori's. Uh, Let's see, what do we have here? This one's three servings. So this was the handmade one that comes in the pudding bag. And you can see that's the book itself. And then behind it is, is sort of the way it's the put pudding it. bags. What a great idea. And I think we have, uh, okay. Yeah, a bit of the process there for you. So those are what are called signatures. They're all printed. The end papers are green and they've been glued on. And now they're just getting sewn up. So you can see I've got my little scissors for trimming mm -hmm. the or the twine. I've got my ball of thread. The little white thing there is a bone folder to help me fold the pages. And uh, inside the little spool of thread is my, my um, book all, which is one of the things that I use for poking those. Interesting. Okay, let me see. I've got, this aha, is, we were I heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great book. So this is uh, Footsteps in Beta Verde. And one of the things that a lot of my kids' books do is they engage folklore, usually Newfoundland folklore, but not always. Um, this is a ghost story by Karis Cotter. Uh, it's one that she learned from a neighbor of hers in, in Beta Verde, and she has told it beautifully. Karis is a wonderful, wonderful uh, storyteller for kids. And the illustrations are by a young woman named Jenny Dwyer, who's an art teacher. She teaches um, in the public system here in, in on the Avalon. Um, first time she's ever illustrated a children's book, and she did just a remarkable job. You can see there's very um, creepy, uh, creepy um, Feeling this book and there's the little sort of claw hand that you see coming in is actually smoke that you carries over from the back cover. It's the smoke from a candle. It sort of plays right. off. The you know, kids are looking or listening to stories. They sort of their imaginations for what the culture, the things in the room become. Yeah. Mm. Job protecting the mood. And, uh, well, I, this is for a little older kids because it's creepy, but there's just something. I think the artwork is just sublime in this one. Oh, that's quite beautiful. And I actually, from your website, I went on and got the link that took me to the virtual book launch for this. If anyone wants to see more of it right off your I'm kind of digging into your website, but it was a beautiful book launch that you did. Yeah. And the story is read there and you can see all the images. Yeah. Yeah. Karis is a great um, reader of her work as well. So that's where I'm very lucky because a lot of the authors with whom I work are fabulous at reading their own books. And so we were talking previously that here's Andy Jones's book, um, Jack and the Green Man. This is the last of his Jack series so far, who knows? Um, <laughs> with the illustrations by Darker Ardelli. And you can see there's a really different um, aesthetic to this book. It has a very, very um, unique sort of visual presence. But um, Andy's a wonderful storyteller, as, as people know, if you remember him at all from Codco and any of his one man shows. And so he's been doing these books as audiobooks recently. So this one is now available as an audiobook on my website and soon will be available on various audio platforms. And so we're really lucky because Andy does the readings himself and they're just brilliant. And then Chris Brooks of Battery Radio has done the recording and his wonderful wife, Christina Smith, is a brilliant musician and she does music for it. And it just makes a really lovely um, a really lovely Package, yeah. Well, I would say that pretty lucky kids that get to read these books and yeah. hear these books. I think I've gone through all the photos. I just want to make sure. Yes, we're back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I hope by showing that, that people can kind of get a feel for, for the, I feel the original 
touches that you're bringing to children's books and you know engaging the writers and artists so much it sounds in the process yeah yeah very much so and um i i one of the things i really love are really beautifully illustrated kids books since i think i didn't give you a picture of and i probably should have one of the, the books i'm most um I mean, you love all the books, but one of the things I'm, I'm proudest of, I think, is a, a book that we did with Bernice Morgan, and she, it's called Seasons Before the War, and it's just really um, reflections upon growing up in St. John's just before the Second World War and what life was like. So it really is a picture of Newfoundland in a, in a completely different time, and we did it as a very large scale book, so it's quite big. The idea was that little kids would curl up with their grannies and grandpas to read the book together. Sort of, so it's almost like a lap book. And when I was looking for the illustrator for that, I wanted somebody who could capture this sense for me of, of Newfoundland in old times, but certainly like not rural Newfoundland, but St. John's. And it occurred to me that a lot of the younger artists that I know in the area would not understand what those places look like. But I was in an art gallery in Scotland I was on vacation and I saw this beautiful artwork by this um, this artist and I said to the person there, I said, to, does she illustrate kids' books because she should really illustrate kids' books? And the woman just kind of looked at me and said, yes, yes, she does illustrate. And it turned out I researched it. She'd done dozens and dozens of kids' books. So I just got up all my courage and I wrote and asked if she would consider it. And she did, she did and she did an absolutely stunning job. And the thing that made it for me was that she lives... She's originally from Sweden, but she lives in a part of the north of England where they still had the little tiny shops that would have been sort of the, because St. John's was so English back you know, before the war, before Confederation, it had those connections. So she lived in a community that had the kinds of shops that would have been in St. John's. And so when you say, wanted a picture of a, the candy shop with the jars of sweets, she knew exactly what you meant about them, you know, if you go into the green grocer and see all the different, you know, the hairs hanging from the from the meat hooks and all she just she knew because she she had lived that so her work for that book is just is just stunning and it's um it's a real treat and, and for me a lot of the fun is finding an illustrator who might not be the illustrator you expect but the illustrator who can find a layer to the story that uh, is new and, and exciting Mm, I find that a very, very intriguing aspect of what you're doing. And I say that because having had children and reading to them, I enjoyed the books. In fact, I still have kept some of the books that were our favorites that we can, you know, we still bring them out. And the illustrations, I mean, depending the age range, of course, there's a point where you're not dealing as much with illustrations. But when that's so much a part of the book, it's so enjoyable to be drawn in. And I think too that illustrations for kids in kids' books can last a lot longer, like in terms of ages. We often think, well, once you're in, you know, once you're reading a chapter book, then you don't need books that are illustrated anymore. But I, but I would disagree with that because I think the illustrations—it's another whole kind of literacy. There's a visual literacy that happens there, and kids are very media savvy. They're very visually savvy these days, so it it would really augment the your interest but also it's just it it's just fun <laughs> so <there's other laughs> it's a beautiful book even if you can read a chapter book right yeah oh no i agree with you and it, it, it's something that it just stays with you and you're right we are many times very visual and it is enjoyable there's always something and if you take the the ghost book we talked about the images in there are very haunting in the way she uses the fog and in any way it's just I think the process that you're doing is so intriguing. It, it just brings so much to it. In general, Marnie, um, how is the market these days for children's books? Is it? Uh, I think it's quite robust, isn't it? It 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 is reasonably so. I mean, the pandemic has made everything a little bit different, um, but children's books has have been sort of one area that seems to have hung on despite you know, Amazon and despite um, eBooks and things like that, because I think the print book market, it's, you can get nice um, eBook versions of kids' books. You can get nice audiobook versions of kids' books, but there is something I think, um, especially with young kids that we still like to sit down and hold a book when we read with them. So it, it has sort of held on pretty well. 
Yeah, I don't think that's ever gonna ever gonna leave us. I hope not. <laughs> no, I hope not to. And Marnie, before before we go, one of the things that I did I did want to ask you is the name of your company, Running the Goat. How <laughs> did where did that come from? Well, that's a dance. It's a traditional Newfoundland set dance um, that has been recorded up in the Northern Peninsula. I, I've heard since that, I mean, it's often associated with uh, Great Harbor Deep, which is a resettled community. Uh, though other people tell me it was danced in other communities as well. And um, it is the best dance ever. I'm, I'm, um, it was kind of legendary. When I moved to St. John's, people, you'd be at dinner parties and people would say, there's this dance, the, the goat, have you seen the goat dance? And, um, and I had never had. And then I was with a group of friends who were learning and practicing dances. And I was sort of invited along, just stood up one night, knowing nothing about Newfoundland folk dancing. And we were practicing different things and learning dances. And at the very end of the night, this was a group of people who loved to run the goat. And so they just said, oh, let's do the goat at sort of the end of the night. And I had no idea. I had never, literally had never seen the dance. And they just handed me to, um, to Jim Payne was one of the dancers. They said, here, you dance with Jim. He'll tell you what to do. And it was the fastest, most wonderful dance. <laughs> and I, it was just exhilarating. And I had so much fun. And there was sort of a moment when there was just nothing except the music and the movement and the rhythm of the drum. And, and um I remember when I decided to start making books, I thought if I could ever make a book that would make me feel the way running the goat did the first time I danced, then that would be a really good book. So that's why I named the press. It's, it's, I, I, and also because a lot of the books are Newfoundland books and they're folk books or have connections to folklore and folk traditions, but mostly because I wanted a book that somehow encapsulated the, uh, the, the sheer delight of that first time that I ran the goat. Mm. Well, that's a lovely story. And the the energy of that, I think you've really captured, you know, in your company from what you've shared with us today. And, and certainly I could talk to you for hours because I find the topics beautiful and intriguing that you're, you're doing this work here in our province. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Oh, and people can get your books um, on your site, Amazon, everywhere that fine books are sold. That's that, yeah, we do have, we have national and international distribution and we've just, we, um, I just, I was saying, I just sent off my first shipment of books to a UK distributor. So I'm hoping that fairly soon they'll be available in the UK as well, which would be wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Marnie, thank you so much for taking the time today to share your story with me and with also all the viewers. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to share some links below for those who catch up with us on YouTube uh, so that you can go check out that dance <laughs> and what inspired Marnie. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're going to pop over to Instagram, but uh, folks, if you, you want to check that out, you can do that later. And thank you so much again. And thank you everyone for enjoying Let's Get Writing and sharing and subscribing. And thank you, Marnie. Thank you so much, Catherine. You're very welcome.